Here is part two of part two of a video that I don't even know if anybody wants, but I'm making it anyways. So let's get started. Whole, the whole point, it, I think it's helpful to always reflect back. The whole point of metabolism is to take the food that we eat and then convert it into energy, right? And if there are long periods of time where maybe you fast all day and then you don't eat till night, there's not much coming in, right? So the body has to make tweaks. And of course, energy production is going to be hindered or downregulated during that time. And so I like Kathleen, like guys, listen to her first original podcast, sharing her story. You were diagnosed with rhabdo. I don't even. I need to find some of this stuff because this has been very interesting. The long list of diagnoses that you receive and instead focusing, taking a step back and be like, wow, that's very overwhelming and scary. Right. I'm going to focus on how my body is producing energy first. And you like slowly dug yourself out of that. Exactly. Hole. Yeah. No, it was a slow yeah. process. And I think that's what, another thing like mo a lot of people have to go pedantically slow, like incredibly slow, especially the further you are into the like. I, I find metabolic syndrome type states, they can go a little bit faster. But if you're more on this kind of like CFS at me, like highly catabolic state, like you need to go even slower. And that's frustrating. And I understand that's frustrating, especially when in a doctor, uh, alternative medicine practitioner, et cetera, is like promising you, oh, we're going to get you out of this immediately. Yeah. I, so I understand. The only thing is, is that like I've had, I've worked with so many people that they, they go that route, they, they try the immediate route and then they end up worse, right? At first it might help for a little bit and then they end up worse. And so, and then you're digging yourself of an even greater hole. So I, I very much understand how much psycho-emotional things are wrapped up in this too. Um, yeah. 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 So, so they saw, um, peptic and intestinal ulcers, um, ulcerative colitis, uh, they saw, I, yeah, I have a quote written down that they did all autopsies during periods of semi-starvation and it showed the presence of ulcerations with thinning of the intestinal wall uh hemorrhages and then atrophy so like when you think of like your muscles shrinking like you can see like your bicep shrinking right if you lose muscle in your bicep it shrinks they saw atrophy of the muscles in the walls of the gastrointestinal tract and that's not good. You know, the the thing that I've been wondering, and one of the questions that I would ask if I could get a hold of any of these three, would it be better? Would it be better if you just got yourself to the calories that you're supposed to be at and saw what happened? Because if you, if it, like, in a, in a crazy starvation uh, situation where you're out, like, I don't know, in the desert and, and everything... Uh, th this is a kind of a crazy example, but uh, like if you're out in the desert and obviously water becomes a huge issue in the desert. Well, a lot of the people that they find dead who didn't survive in the desert are found with a, a fairly large amount of water with them. And they say that it's better if you just drink all the water and let your body handle it than if you try to handle it yourself. So I wonder in that, in that same kind of thought process if you would be better off getting yourself to the calories that you needed to be and just letting the body do what it needs to do the thought those muscles are literally responsible for helping you break down your food and move food through you so if that atrophies food isn't going to move now in this case that probably would be detrimental because you're not going to be able to digest it quickly through you higher chances of SIBO developing or, you know, thinning of the intestinal wall. Exactly. So, um, and then I really like to hear about the, sorry, sorry. Autopsies. I, there was just a lag. Go, go ahead. No, it's okay. I just like when they talked about the autopsies, literally showing that for those that were in a, a, a low energy availability state, like these things were literally changed. Yeah, and everyone's talking about like serotonin and stuff in the GI, and it's like, well, serotonin wouldn't need to be called into the GI if your peristalsis, et cetera, is working appropriately, right? Like, yes, some amount of serotonin is there needed for peristalsis, but, you know, even things like histamine issues, like histamine is fundamentally needed for um, gastric acid se secretion. And so, like, why are people having such issues with histamine nowadays, especially because, so they talk about 
Most of the available reports indicate a gastric hypoacidity and hyposecretion and starvation. The total acidity values were exceptionally low in the cases with edema. And so again, like why, why are we having all these issues with histamine containing foods and stuff? Um, everyone's having to take DAO or we're having to take like PPIs and all this stuff when histamine is part of the signal to release stomach acid, which is needed to break down our food to get to the, the um, constituents, you know, the micros, et cetera. Yeah. Sorry, I, I so know like, I'm like, like so passionate about this, but it, it, it's I know. like... <laughs> Can you explain this? The What you just said about serotonin is very interesting. So you're... In layman's terms. You're saying that because gastric motility is slow, ser more serotonin is recruited? Yeah, to, to oh, come wow. into... Yeah, because serotonin helps to um, allow for more peristalsis. And so if you're not adequately peristalsing because of, for example, a lack of muscle mass there to do that, well, then you're going to have to have other things come in to help that, right? And then so that's why you can see things like swinging to diarrhea because you have to call in so much serotonin that, okay, it just becomes liquid at this point because usually when serotonin comes in, you have fluid, you have water come in, and that's what creates the diarrhea. I see. Okay, that's cool. Um, so they then talked about like a few things that they saw in the Minnesota starvation experiment with like delayed gastric motility, um, position of the stomach. And I thought the coolest thing was they saw a change in where the stomach was in the body. So in general, during semi that is crazy. If, if whoever has been watching my channel for a long time, we'll know that I went to an osteopath man, osteopathic manipulator, which is one of these, they are doctors, but they kind of work with the fascia and the body and everything and kind of just they'll touch over here and something over here. Or, like they were working like referred pain and, and all that kind of stuff. But one of the times I, I, I told him that I was having all this like kind of weird stuff going on in my gut. And he goes in there and he's like, dude, your your stomach is in your armpit and your liver's in the wrong place. He's, he's like, were you in a severe accident? I said, not that I know of, you know, <laughs> like, I, no. Um, so, wow. So, man, this is like full circle. Diversion, they saw the stomach drop. Mine went up. Mine, you know, was in the, it was in the wrong place. And when... When he moved it, oh, that was the weirdest feeling I've ever had. So, Kathleen, do you think that that is, um, all right, cells don't have enough energy, so then they can't maintain the proper structure. And so the stomach, the muscles supporting stomach position were atrophied? Yeah, I think uh, I think a lot of it has to do with just pressure management in the torso. Um you know, because people will say, oh, it's because of the lack of body mass there. But I also think it has to do with the the energy, the energetic like demand from the nervous system, maintaining the, the muscular, et cetera, et cetera, support to hold those organs. And they only measured the stomach. But if the stomach is dropping, you can guarantee every other organ is dropping. So, you know. What, what implications do you think that has on, like, for example, stomach acid production? If your if your stomach drops and is at an angle, is that going to disrupt? Yeah, I I don't know. I, 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 don't, I mean, I don't, we we don't have the research about that, obviously, but I would posit yes. I mean, what's what? How is that changing things like the gallbladder and people having issues with their gallbladder or their pancreas or you know like literally any any organ, um, the liver. So. Yeah, and, and again, like people nowadays are being diagnosed with hiatal hernias and, um, uh, you know, malls and, you know, all these other like quote unquote structural things. But again, we know that these things are related to anorexia and anorexia is like an extreme low energy availability state, right? And so it, it's not, so, so like, yeah, it's not surprising to me that people are seeing these things seem to be rising nowadays. Yep. And then again, back to like even the pelvic floor issues. That reaction. Yep. Well, I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, it, it, none of this stuff was seen even when I was growing up, which I, was a longer ago than I, I would like it to be. Like, is your pelvic floor 
like, is that really a pelvic floor issue? Or is it because like your abdominal contents have come down and now you're like changing the pressure dynamics and, you know, and like diaphragm issues. And um, yeah, like, so again, I see all of these things being very much linked. And again, let's like kind of support the foundational layer of course, still do the pelvic floor work and, you know, the breath work and all that stuff too. I'm, I think those things are great, but like, let's also support the foundational layer of like why this might've happened in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Cause again, the Minnesota starvation subjects, they were eating in a calorie deficit for 24 weeks. Right. And I mean, think of how long some people promote like eating very low calorie or on like a very restrictive diet where their metabolism just down regulates. And so Imagine the structural changes in the positioning of organs after a few years, right. not just 24 weeks. Yeah. Um, I wrote down a quote from, um, they were quoting someone else and it said, uh, the gut wall is sometimes so thin that print can be read through it and often to the naked eye does not appear to possess any mucosa at all. This is especially so with the small bowel while the large gut is as a rule lined by shallow confluent ulcers with paper thin mucosa between them. There is a reason to believe that in starvation, the alimentary enzymes may share in the generalized protein depletion and that the power to digest will therefore become affected end quote. So again, just showing like they've done these autopsies, just like how we were saying earlier where this that's insane. You know, there's, there's a museum actually in Cleveland. I don't remember what it's called. It's like a medical museum and you could see how thin, like they've, you know, taken organs out of people and see how thin the actual intestines are. It's, I don't know how they function. Skin looked very like clear and didn't have sufficient, you know, enzymes or sufficient nutrient delivery. Like the gut lining wall was clear. Yeah, it says paper thin and thing. paper thin. Everybody has leaky gut and all this, these different things. Yeah. Right, right. And and that, again, that's not to say that like, you know, heavy metals, glyphosate, like all these things aren't at play either. But at the same time, if you're consuming those things, well, you're going to need even more energy to deal with them, right? And if your GI is already paper thin, like how how is the body supposed to deal with those things? You know, how is yeah. the body supposed to keep those things in the GI? let them go into the bile, you know, go into the stool, et cetera, be excreted versus like, okay, well, I guess it's just coming through because it's damaged anyways. Yeah. Like no doubt glyphosate and pesticides are problems. Um, but if you're in a low energy availability state, those are going to be even harder for your body to deal with. Right. Well, yeah. Like you guys said about the pathogens, yeah. you're more right. susceptible to not being able to actually deal with those, how you should. Yeah. So then yeah, you get yeah. different things like, like you said, SIBO, overgrowth, Lyme disease. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, so this is back before we really had an, more of an understanding of like the gut brain connection. So they said uh, changes in personality, such as an increase in depression, which we'll talk about in the psychology um, section in the future. Uh, Durian writers talked about this. I think McDougal has too. Might be correlated with changes in gastric motility. They knew that um, there was an influence on gastrointestinal activity to a considerable degree on one psychology. And, and we definitely see this too. It seems like people, the it, there seems to be a correlation in the less motility you have. I would argue that the people who, but the people who eat more when they're depressed might actually be better off. For me, my eating gets even worse. The more like, I just don't eat. Psychi you know, psychiatric, et cetera, issues you, you, so one might have. I don't want to know SIBO people. Yeah. You might have these yeah. things. Well, I mean, it's so imagine having constipation. It's so frustrating. Like yeah. I've been there and a lot of people in our course report just like feeling it's it becomes their whole focus. Yeah. Their I was there all the time when I was doing keto carnivore. I don't know how you're not. There's no fiber in it. Your whole life mission is to go to the bathroom every day. Right. And exactly. And, you know, people in my second to last video, I think it was, were making fun of how much I ate. Like if you're not going to the bathroom, but you're still hungry and your wall, the walls of your intestines are getting completely blocked up by all the animals that you're eating. Like, of course, you're going to be eating more calories just to try to absorb something. You know, it, it, I, people just don't understand, I guess. And when when it's such a hard effort, that's very 
challenging psychologically you feel more bloated so you're going to eat less because you're like oh my gosh so that just feeds into yep. itself and that's yeah. a horrible cycle to be in so i totally understand how that could impact somebody psychologically right um but yeah it doesn't mean you need to be eating less food and that's the hard part when you're already bloated yeah, if anything, it means that you need to be eating more food. I mean, obviously, in that state, you need to find foods that you easily digest that maybe aren't as voluminous, um, you know, but are still micronutrient dense, etc. Um, and just continually slowly increase it from there. Um, but yeah, it, it is hard. And, and it's like what we saw with like the edema issue, too. And we'll talk about that in the future, too. But like, you know, people start to eat more and then they put on all this body water. And so they see the scale jump up and then they're like, oh my goodness, I don't want this to happen. Like there's a lot of psycho-emotional stuff wrapped up in there. I completely understand. But then we restrict again, right? I see this in the comments all the time. And then they go back on carnivore. And it's just going to keep on happening. And then we put us in the even worse LEA. And then when we try to come out of it again, we the scale weight jumps up again because of the, the edema problem or the bloating problem or, you know, whatever. And, and so it is very hard at like body image wise to come out of these things. And I very much respect yeah. that. Um, so I, I think that, you know, people really need to do work on the psycho emotional side to be okay with this, you know, and, and again, that doesn't mean we're putting on loads and loads of fat. Right. And I just want to say too, like if your weight jumps up like five pounds overnight, it's water, it's not fat. Like it will eventually come off it now, but we also saw it can take weeks or months to come off. So we need to remember that. But if it if your weight immediately jumped up, that's water. So so just know it's water. Eventually, sometime it will come off. It's not fat. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Assessing your week to week trends are much more relevant here rather than day to day. Like right. if your week trends are rising, you're probably eating too much right now. Right. But um, weighing yourself as often as you can, and then looking comparing that average to the week prior, to the week prior, to the week prior. Um, do you have time to run through respiration really fast or? Yeah, I didn't have too many notes for mm -hmm. respiration. I have to make Brandon's lunch, but if you guys want to wrap it okay. up, that's fine. Okay. All, All right. Sounds good. That sounds good. Here. That sounds good to me. All right, I'll talk so to we just later. did chapter 26, which is the, Thanks, the, the gut. And then chapter 27 is respiration. Um, I kind of just like, basically the ability to like exchange gases uh how how would you describe to someone like what's the importance of respiration in the body i mean in a way respiration is fundamental right because if we're not getting oxygen to the cell now okay there are people that argue that the oxygen we breathe in isn't necessarily going to the cells and that the cells are getting oxygen through like splitting water and other things Possibly. I mean, I, I am open to different interpretations and what's going on, but we need to get things out of the body. We need to get gases out of the body yeah. and we need to get gases into the body. And that's what respiration yep. is for. So like the, the big thing with respiration is bohr haldane And that's basically, you know, hemoglobin goes to the cells, picks up carbon dioxide um, when the partial pressure is sufficiently high enough. It picks up the carbon dioxide, releases the oxygen to the cells, goes back through, goes to the lungs, releases the carbon dioxide, obviously oxygen pressure, you know, in the external environment is such that it is that then the hemoglobin picks up the oxygen and then vice, you know, it keeps going. We also breathe out other things too. Like we breathe out some serotonin and stuff. We breathe out water. Um, so it's not only about oxygen and carbon dioxide, but those are like the two biggest things I think people would look to. So like it's, imp this is important. Gas yeah. exchange is very important. And if we reflect back to I mean, carbon dioxide is actually more important than uh, people think it is, too. Cellular energy metabolism, and we have our metabolites, which is the food that we're consuming. We want those to go through the electron transport chain. The better we can do that, one of the byproducts of cellular metabolism is CO2. And so the more like intracellular CO2 that we're going to have due to better energy production, the more that oxygen can get to the cells and this whole respiration and exchange of gases functions as it's supposed to and it functions better and quickly. So basically this chapter is demonstrating that when in a low energy availability state, that exchange of gases is disrupted. Exactly. And that has pro It's just so it's just so widespread. Found <clears throat> impacts. Yeah. Yeah, and so this is where you get into talks about like pseudohypoxia with cancer, for example, where there is sufficient oxygen available, or it seems like there should be sufficient oxygen available, 
but yet for whatever reason we're you know uh, wasting to lactate or we're not doing glucose metabol you know glucose metabolism correctly or we're not doing amino acid metabolism you know like glutamate uh, or fatty acid oxidation correctly um so yeah i think that this has big implications on things um so they they see in starvation areas an increase in uh, tuberculosis which I always find tuber tuberculosis interesting because there's like a big tie between TB and the adrenal glands, especially like adrenal insufficiency. And then there's a big tie with like EBV and the thyroid. So I don't know, I'm, I'm always thinking about those things in the back of my mind. Um, so they say t TB, bronchitis, and emphysema. Um, the big thing that they see though is the respiratory rate decreases. And this is something that like kind of bothers me nowadays, to be honest, because a lot of people will say, you, you know, there's this huge push to lower your respiratory rate, to slow your breathing down. And yes, sometimes this can be really. Yeah. You know, honestly, I had to stop doing it. Like the meditation really teaches that meditation, yoga. And I, I actually found that it was making uh, things worse. Helpful, um, especially like if you're having a, a panic attack, like that, that can be helpful. Um, and it can be like it can be helpful if you're not over the long term not used to if you don't have a good CO2 tolerance, right? But we shouldn't be lowering our respiratory rate. We should be increasing our CO2 production. And this again goes back to metabolism, right? Because, you know, they, they see like, I almost think we should be trying to maintain the respiratory rate of like a teenager or like a, a early 20 year old, right? And their respiratory rate is not four breaths per minute. It's like, well, I'll have to look it up when, when you're talking, but it's like 12 or something breaths per minute. Like it's a lot, you know, where people yeah. nowadays are saying, no, you want a lower respiratory rate. And I understand. I mean, I have times where I actually just stop breathing altogether. It's ridiculous. I'll be out driving. I'm like, shit, I haven't breathed for like a, a minute. And why they're doing it because again, they're trying to build up CO2 in the body, which is what we want, right? We want to build up the CO2 state in the body. But again, like, why is the body not naturally doing that? Why is yeah. it in it, you know, what's going on with the glucose metabolism? What's going on with the LEA? One of the things I know that I'm cutting in a lot, that Wim Hof, you know, and then you do that for like 30 times and then you hold your breath. Well, it's so euphoric to hold your breath that I find myself doing that. ...state that we're not building enough CO2 that way. So essentially, like, I think something that's very well documented is the more CO2 that the body has internally, the better that oxygen can be delivered to cells and therefore the better energy metabolism occurs. Mm -hmm. As Kathleen mentioned, in cancer, something that we see is like an excessive reliance on glycolysis, which is energy production without oxygen. So there's something going wrong where oxygen is not getting to the cells and you produce like significantly less ATP when you don't use oxygen versus oxidative phosphorylation when you, I think, produce 36 to 38 ATP and glycolysis is significantly less. So oxygen availability to the cells is very important. And so having higher levels of CO2 inside of us is required because then oxygen gets delivered properly. It's the proper exchange of the gases. And so one thing that Dr. Pete has pointed out is that the literature consistently demonstrates that those who live at higher altitudes, so like uh, Colorado, they for some reason live longer. They have better health metrics and it's potentially to the exposure of higher CO2. So then you go back to, you know, global warming and whether that's bad for humans um, getting more CO2 in. But there's multiple different ways you can increase CO2 in the body. And you hear people talking about like bag breathing or buteco breathing and slowing down your breath so that you exhale less CO2. And then also drinking like carbonated beverages are another way to increase CO2. Well, the so best way to do it, the one that will move the lever forward in increasing your in internal CO2 is through energy production and increasing the rate and the speed at which metabolites move through the electron transport chain and you get more CO2 inside the cells. And I'd also like to know what they had to say about the body temperature thing and as far as uh, metabolism goes. This is why we're all fans of carbohydrates because when you oxidize carbohydrates, you produce 50% more CO2 inside the cells than with fat. So I think Kathleen, what you're saying is like, we are so focusing on these little things that can improve CO2, right. but the best way to improve CO2 inside the body is by improving energy production. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. And, and we know like, see, I mean, carbon, it's literally in 
the word carbohydrate. I mean, <laughs> it's right there, folks. So two is important for like the calcium oscillations. And, you know, everyone is on like a, you know, calcium channel blocker nowadays, or, you know, calcium channel oscillations are crucial for every neurotransmitter hormone um, release. They're, they're crucially important for any kind of muscular activity. So they literally do, they're part of every thing that the cell does, right? And so, yeah. you know, so yeah. So I looked at the breast per minute, um, a 12 to 18 year old, and then at 18, so 12 to 18 years old, it's 12 to 16 is like the, the normal breaths average minute. breaths per minute. And then over wow. 18, it should be about 12 to 20. So it's like, you know, and you see this again with the aging population as they're getting older, especially as they're nearing death, their respiratory rate declines drastically. Yeah. And so like, yeah. I, so I understand like, yes, we should be building oxygen or sorry, CO2 tension, but we should be doing that with the metabolism, not by co taking conscious control of our respiration. And that's another thing too, like respiration is under autonomic control. Like it'd be trying to like take conscious control of my heartbeat, for example. Like, I don't think that's where we should be spending our mental. Can you imagine how exhausting that would be? <laughs> how many more calories you would actually need in your day? So activity, right? Like, yeah sure sure like if, if you want to do it throughout the day if you find it calming if you enjoy it like all that stuff i think that's great but let's like let's focus on the more fundamental issue of why are we not producing sufficient co2 the the other thing about the altitude is um you also have less oxygen pressure up there so that's another reason why the co2 is building up in the bodies because again the borholbane effect of you know building up enough oxygen in order to uh yeah have it dissociate one one of my favorite parts of the chapter was like okay they showed that semi-starvation reduces respiration right. and then that impacted their ability to exercise. So think of the amount of people who have exercise intolerance right now. Um, if your respiration is impacted, of course, you're not going to be able to create the energy required during those periods where your body is exerting itself. Exactly. So they yeah. measured the respiration during aerobic and anaerobic exercise conditions, and there was differences relative to their control state right. of it, like that exchange of gases impacts the work output. And that's a future chapter, but it impacts the work output that your body is able to do. Exactly. Yeah. And, and again, I just want to. It would also affect your recovery ability too. I like how slow the. Um, so, so once you're in this state, how slow it takes to recover. So they said, I, I swear I have not watched this video, but like, I, I hear them saying this stuff before they say it. I have not watched this video. That after 12 weeks of rehabilitation, all these changes had been reversed, but the values were, were by no means back to normal. And so, um, it did, it took them, you know, closer to like 24 plus weeks for many people in order for them to see more normal values based off like tidal volume, um, respiration rates, uh, all, all of that stuff. Yeah. Then, uh, of course, like it's not various organs inside the body help with respiration. And so mm -hmm. they noted here that, uh, Starvation resulted in a substantial loss of strength in the respiratory muscles. Yeah. And so again, just showing, you know, we go from liver to the gut to now to like. It is a hot mess. What is going on right now? I mean, just just off these videos that I've watched. Lungs and heart, like a, when you see a loss of mass, it's going to impact the function. Yeah, and I will say, you know, from firsthand account, when I would have bad rhabdo, it was very hard for me to breathe. Like, everything hurt. All of my intercostals, like everything, trying to breathe, trying to allow my... I was actually just trying to do the Wim Hof. I had the gate uh, on this, so you couldn't hear me breathing. But it was actually hurting my intercostals to try to do it. My, you know, rib cage to expand so my lungs could expand. It was very difficult. And... It's not like you almost feel like you're, you know, people talk about like air hunger and stuff. Which is ridiculous because I was just out on the bike two nights ago because I like riding at night because it's not as windy because it's so windy over here. And uh, I was riding like the, the wind, but I don't know. I don't, it's, it's weird. Stuff nowadays, like 
it is not a fun feeling to feel like you can't breathe. And then especially add on top that it, it's like physically hurting to breathe. But my throat and everything, I was like sore in my like lung region, even though I've been riding, uh, you know, like at least three, four times a week. Um, so yeah, yeah. so yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a hard one. <laughs> The resting, I just have like a percentage here for people to see like how much it was declined. The resting pulmonary ventilation, this was one of the things that they measured. It decreased by 31% at the end of the, the semi-starvation. So again, just 24 weeks, decreased that by 31%. And yeah. like you said, after 12 weeks of rehab, it improved, but it was not back to the levels that it was at, at control. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And, and so, you know, I think respiration talking about like, um, exercise intolerance and stuff like, I think this is the reason why things like zone two, et cetera, can be really helpful because I think people do need to, you know, just challenge the, the respiratory muscles, their ability to rapidly cycle, um, you know, oxygen and carbon dioxide, et cetera. Um, however, like if you're in a low energy availability state, it's going to make it that much harder to do that. And so, you know, it's about like slowly building up your zone two ability, but then also making sure you're building your, your overall energetic ability. Yeah. Yep. And, and that's kind of all like I had all, written. All yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's what I had too. I think just, again, um, I hope that these conversations just give people hope that like, if you focus on the foundations, don't get don't get lost in the weeds of of certain you know hacks or diet camps or things like that and and focus more on building that foundation of providing your body the energy that it needs at regular intervals and i know the feeling of being stressed and just not wanting to eat until later in the day but that that really does have negative implications and doing this like fast 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 binge eating all your food at the end of the day it's not going to help the situation right. Right. And, and again, like when we say binge, we're not necessarily saying that you're eating like 5,000 calories or, you know, an excess amount yeah. of calories. It's just like you're eating all 1,500 or whatever at one time or 2,000. Uh, obviously, I don't think people should be eating 1,500 most of the time. Um, but yeah, you're eating it all together versus spread throughout the day. And then we kind of wonder yeah. why we have these symptoms throughout the day and then changing symptoms at nighttime and all of that stuff. Yep. So. Yep. Yeah. I, and again, I, I, I hope people take this as a very positive thing, right? Like, because it's, it's like you look at how many systems and how everything is impacted by this. And so, you know, do all the other things in conjunction with it, but like slowly continue to chip away at this and increase your maintenance calories very slowly. So we're not putting on fat mass again, you will probably see an edema spike and, and that's okay. You know, um, it, it will eventually come back down again. We can't say for certain when it will, but it, it could be months. Like it could take a, a long time. And so you just need to like continue. Um, and yeah, and you just set yourself up for a way better, you know, stage. You're more robust when, when things happen and stuff. So yeah, regularly feeding yourself is a very underestimated tool for health. 100%. Yeah. All right. Speaking of eating, I need to go make lunch. <laughs> 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 All right. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, next time we'll go over more of the physiology. Okay. Well, obviously that's it, but, uh, interesting stuff. And that is the end of part two of this video, but yeah, I mean, food for thought, literally anyway, comments, questions down below, like subscribe, and I'll talk to you in the next one.